O to nasna ijeza, o to nasna ijeza, ijeza, o to nasna ijeza, ijeza, o to nasna ijeza, o to nasna ijeza, ijeza, O to nasna ijeza Good afternoon. I'd like to invite Lillian Wright to come up to say the opening prayer. Uh, if you could all stand, please. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, that we're able to come together. And I thank you, Lord, uh, for the dream that came uh, to be today and thank you for all the safety for everyone that's been, been able to come here and I pray Lord as we look at the outfits that we've made for the past two years that the Gwich'in people would be proud to be Gwich'in and I pray that we'll pass on the knowledge and I just thank you and give you honor for everything you have done for us in Jesus name I pray Amen <laughs> Good afternoon, Drin Gwizi. On behalf of the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute and the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre and the seamstresses from Aklavik, Burr McPherson, Inuvik, Tsigaychik and Yellowknife, I would like to welcome you to the Gwich'in Traditional Clothing Project Celebration. My name is Ingrid Critch. I'm the research director of the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute, or GSCI. It gives me great pleasure to attend this historic event with you today. For the first time in over 100 years in the NWT, you will have the opportunity to see five traditional Gwich'in caribou skin outfits. These men's summer outfits were crafted over a two and a half year period by a team of 40 seamstresses. They are replicas of an original outfit dating to the 1860s and held in the collection of the Canadian Museum of Civilization in Hull. To date, no examples of which in clothing have survived in museums or in the communities in the NWT. And that is why this project is so important to residents in the North. Now that the replicas have been completed, each of the four Gwich'in communities will receive one outfit for permanent display. The fifth outfit will be displayed here in Yellowknife at the museum. This is likely the only time that all five will be seen together, so you are truly experiencing a unique event. This project results from a partnership between the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute and the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre with the assistance of the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Funding for the project was generously provided by the Department of Canadian Heritage through the Museum's Assistance Program, by the Department of Education, Culture and Employment through the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre and the GSCI. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the tremendous creative skills, the patience, and the determination of the seamstresses in bringing alive again this traditional form of caribou skin clothing. Clothing which reflects the importance of caribou and the close relationship that the Gwich'in still have with the land. In a few moments, we'll have the opportunity uh, to see the outfits, but before we do so, I would like to invite our honored guests to say a few words. First, I would like to invite the Honourable Jake Otis, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment, to the podium. Mr. Otis. Thank you, uh, Ingrid. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be here today on this uh, very special and very unique occasion. Uh, I'm very pleased to see so many people here. It's wonderful to uh, see the attention that this is getting and that it deserves. Um, in December 2000, the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute formed a partnership with a number of groups and organizations to create uh, five replicas of 19th century Gwich'in 
man's summer outfit. And this particular project provided an opportunity to document, to understand, to appreciate how clothing was made in those days, and also to repatriate the skills and knowledge that was used in those days. I want to thank the seamstresses that are with us here today. Uh, they are part of uh, 40 seamstresses uh, who were craftspeople, who worked together over the life of the project. The unveiling today is a very historic landmark. It's the first time in a century that these traditional clothings have been shown publicly and have been recreated. As Ingrid has said, uh, there has been no example of Gwich'in clothing that was available that could be reproduced. And so the seamstresses, the museum staff, and their leaders traveled to the Museum of Civilization in Ottawa, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, and overseas to see the work of their ancestors. And I'm proud of the partnership that developed out of that. The Museum of Civilization, the Department of Heritage Canada through the Museum's Assistance Program, the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute, and of course the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre, where we are today. The seamstresses have created these works of tremendous cultural value and the outfits will be, dis will be displayed in the four Gwich'in communities of Anuvik, Aklavik, Sikachik, and Fort McPherson, and of course here at the Prince Wales Northern Heritage Centre. I'd like to thank the uh, on behalf of the people of the Northwest Territories, all the people that worked on this project, the seamstresses that are here with us today, and those who could not join us who are in the communities. I'd also like to thank Karen Wright Fraser, Ingrid Critch, Joanne Bird, Judy Thompson, and I want to wish everyone all the best and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Otis. Now, if I may, I would like to invite Ms. Anna Mae McLeod to the podium. Um, she is a representative of the Gwich'in Tribal Council and the chair of GSEI. If she could please say a few words. Anime. Jin Greenzy. Uh, I'll say the first speech on behalf of Fred Carmichael, the president of the Gujin Tribal Council. Uh, he was unable to attend his, this historic event for the Gujin people. Fred has asked me to pass on this message to you in his absence. I am pleased to celebrate with you the display of this beautiful collection of traditional Gwich'in clothing on behalf of the Gwich'in Tribal Council Board of Directors and all of the beneficiaries. I wish to thank all the seamstresses under the guidance of both Karen Wright Fraser and the Gwich'in Social and Culture Institute for their hard work in making this important Gwich'in cultural project a huge success. I would also like to thank the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage for their continued support for this project and their interest in Gwich'in heritage. My thanks also to the Department of Canadian Heritage through the Museum Assistance Program and the Department of Education, Culture and Employment to the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre for funding this project. Our Gwich'in ancestries were a proud people and also protected, protectors of the land and of the caribou. It is so nice to share this tradition with everyone who has an opportunity to view the, these replicas re re of 19th century Gwich'in men summer caribou skin outfits. I look forward to attending similar celebrations in each of the four Gwich'in communities of Aklavik, Fort McPherson, Inuvik, and Sigachik in the upcoming months. Masi Cho, it is proud to be Gwich'in. Fred Carmichael, President. On behalf of the G. Gwich'in Social and Culture Institute as the chairperson, I would also like to thank all the seamstresses who were inspired to sew such beautiful Gwich'in men garments, and to Karen Wright Fraser, who took the lead responsibility 
on the sewing and the training of the seamstresses and Gwich'in skills needed to carry out the project. I would also like to thank our partners, the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre, for their support throughout the project. In particular, Chuck Arnold, Joanne Bird, Tom Andrews, Barb Cameron, Maggie Demio, Morris M. Metco, Terry Pamplin, Ross Scott, Paulette Olerhead, Diane Partree, Ian Morn, Kalinda Latour, and Norm Glothwich. And from the Canadian Museum of Civilization, I thank Judy Thompson for assistance and sharing of her knowledge about Gwich'in clothing. Thanks to Michelle Latour and Sue Glothwich from the Department of Education, Culture and Employment for the wonderful job they have done with pub publicizing this celebration. Thanks to both the current and the past Gwich'in staff, the uh, Gwich'in Social and Culture Institute staff, Ingrid Critch, Alistine Andre, Grace Blake, Rita Carpenter, Ruby Lenny, Mavis Clark, Lisa Andre, William George Firth, and Leslie McCartney. On behalf of the Gwich'in Masik. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the two northern partners in this project, the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute and the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre, it's my honour to thank the third key partner, the Canadian Museum of Civilization. The CMC graciously shared information about Gwich'in clothing in their collections and loaned a set of garments to us so that it could be brought to Yellowknife and studied at one of the workshops that we held in this auditorium about two years ago now. They also loaned us Judy Thompson, and I would like to see if I can spot her and ask her to come up on the stage for a moment. Special thanks really go to Judy. Judy is the curator of subarctic ethnology at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, and it's her encouragement, her enthusiasm that I think really helped us bring this project to the conclusion, the successful conclusion that we're going to see part of today. Judy arranged and hosted visits at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. She accompanied the research team to the Smithsonian Institute to see Gwich'in garments there. And through Judy, we were able to access patterns used for the garment shown here today. I'd really like to also acknowledge a volunteer at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, Dorothy Burnham, a longtime volunteer at the CMC, who drew the patterns that were used to create the clothing. Judy also came to Yellowknife two years ago to participate in the workshop when the seamstresses first started on this project. So Judy, I'd like to thank you and uh, forgive the plain brown wrapper, <laughs> but we've got a few tokens of our appreciation for you. Thank you very much. You, can open you may open them here. I've been told I can open this and I have a Speaking suspicion, I know what one of them is. All of a sudden, it came to me what I was going to see in here. This very, very beautiful book on the history and stories of the Gwich'in, which Ingrid was just telling me about, I think, at lunchtime. Is this the one? And I was already thinking, how am I going to get myself a copy of this book? <laughs> so that's just wonderful. I feel um, a little bit silly being thanked uh, for this, because to me, this has been such a rare privilege. It's been a gift to me to be able to work with all you wonderful people on this project. Uh, I think for many of us who work in museums and we feel very privileged to work with beautiful older material, it's kind of a dream that we can give that back to the community and that there will be people there who can use this information and share it with us. So this has been a very reciprocal experience and as I say, it's been just a gift to me. So thank you very much. I want to say like everyone else is saying today, congratulations to all the seamstresses who worked so hard on this. Well, I know it hasn't been an easy project. Again, thank you for everything. It's been just great, and also for these gifts, which I certainly didn't expect. I would now like to introduce Virginia Elder Elizabeth Collin. Elizabeth will recount an old-time Gwich'in story. This story speaks to the great value placed in traditional Gwich'in society on women who worked hard and sewed well in order to take care of their families and the consequences of one woman's complaint about doing so. Elizabeth? 
Good afternoon. Uh, I have a story to tell. Uh, it's an old time story, a legend of our of the Gutschen. Uh, it's about a man leaving his uh, wife behind to die. And it was in the fall time. In the fall time that when uh, we're out on the land, like long ago, they, they don't stay one place. They're always moving with the caribou. And in the fall time, on little snow, they were getting ready to move. So all the women, all the women had to start sewing, making shoes, making mitts, making parkas. And this one woman here, her, she got a tall husband, and his wife cut out, cut out a, from the skin. And when she finished it, it had a long, real big uh, outfit, and she was she joke she was uh, she joke saying, how long. How big pants I got to sew, you know, and her old man hurt her, and he wasn't too pleased about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people were ready to leave. They were ready to leave and move, move where the caribou is. So her husband got a plan to leave her behind. So everybody was going to move. They were getting ready, loading up and everything. And you know, he went and left her. He left her with nothing. And he took everything from her and left her with nothing. And the people were even afraid to do anything, to, to say anything to him. But she had one uh, friend, a real good friend, partners. But in a way, he was going around to different uh, camps making sure nobody left any food or fire or anything. But she had a partner that seen what was going on. And while the man was looking around camps uh, making sure nobody left anything, she ran to her and told her, in my camp, in the corner, I left a coal and some sinew. So before that man see her, she ran back to the group, and they left. They left her behind. And after everybody left, you know, she went to that woman's camp, and she found that coal. And she met. She met fire with it. She kept. You know, she met that fire with it, and she kept it all winter to spring. She never let that fire out. And with that snare, Sinu snare, she said snare. You know, when you leave camp, the first the animal or birds to come is the crow. So crows came to the camp to find out if there's anything to eat. And that's and she thought, I'll snare them. And she did. She snared crows and she skinned it. And with that she made clothes for herself. <coughs> and then with the sinew in the crow feet, she joined them together and she made snares too. <coughs> And it says that she moved to, she moved to where there's lots of trees. And that's where too she caught a lot of rabbits. And she made a, a rabbit outfit for herself. And from out of that rabbit fur too, she made a big teepee for herself, listen. And then she started getting porcupine, porcupine too. And she take the quills out. And then she started dyeing them with uh, berries, some plants from the in, out on the land. And she, 
she dyed them and she made different colors out of it. <coughs> and she started sewing, she started making um, fancy designs on what she was, on the outfits that she made for, for herself. And they said even her TP was just decorated up. But in a way, then she moved to the river, the bank of the river. And she was really doing good. She was left behind to die, but she survived with that fire, that was that coal that was left for her. And she had a trail down to the river for water, and she made her pails out of birch bark. That's what she made her pails out of, and that's what she got her water. And then one day there, she went to get water, and she looked, and there was canoe coming with two men in it. So she went back to her camp and ran in the bush. When they came, they landed, they went up to her camp and nobody. But they, they checked the camp and it was a lot of, they seen everything was so good, you know. And they called to her and she won't come out. And she to, he, they told her, we're going to look after you. We're going to look after you, and they asked her to come out. So she did. She cooked them a meal, and she fed them. And they stayed with her. They start hunting for caribou. They get moose. With the first caribou that they got, they told her to make an outfit for herself. Because she had this rabbit skin outfit. So she did. and. After she did that, she made outfit for both of them too. And they would hunt, they would um, fix all the meat. And then when they hunt again, they didn't bring anything back. They finished this and then they moved. They, keep, they kept doing that. And it was said that she had, they had two big weak ones, one to sleep in and one to a store food in. And then this one day there, it was said that people came, they were starving. And it was the same people that left her to die. The same people that her husband was with. <coughs> and what they did was, she got those two men to, and herself, they fed they were feeding everybody. And you know, when you're a good worker, a woman of everything, they said she was just giving out those uh, caribou skin by, and she had all kinds of uh, like dry meat, itsu, meatballs, and uh, marrow, fat, all those good things that you like. She was giving out to everybody her and her, those two men. But in a way, her friend that helped her, she went to her friend and she told her, come and stay with me, I, I made a big teepee for you. And that's what she did. She did, and when that, her partner came, it's just everything in that big teepee that she had for her friend. But you know, she did a lot of a, Good sewing with that a porcupine quills that time, and it said that too that after everybody was fed and they got their strength by, and by that time it was getting to spring and it was getting warmer, and everybody went their own ways. End of story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Shalakat. <laughs> that means hello, all my friends. It's really nice to see everybody here today. We made it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> this was a big project. Whoa, I couldn't believe it, you know. I was really honored when Ingrid invited me to take part in this project, and I thought, 
It is, it, I didn't think it was going to be this difficult, but it was. But, um, you know, now that we come made it to this day, it's been well worth it. And I'm really proud to uh, present um, these five outfits. But first, let me just say to um, all the 40 seamstresses that worked on this project, a lot of times there were, there were times when some of the communities fell behind, <coughs> behind schedule because there's so much to do in the, at home. So when we would get together in the communities, we would get together in one community and do a big workshop. The, all the other communities would help and we help one community catch up, you know, and we'd all work on one outfit and everybody would feel better. And because uh, it was a little overwhelming and sometimes some people were frustrated and, you know, it was like, could we really do this? But we all encouraged each other and we did it and we're here today. <laughs> so I would like to introduce um, or present the Aklavik outfit, which is modeled by Brandon Albert. Brandon is the son of Corinne Albert and Christy Albert is his grandmother. And they're both in the crowd today. And this outfit is, as you can see, you know, all the fringes are wrapped with porcupine quills and um, there are silver willow seeds on them. We used uh, a lot of beadwork too, as well as porcupine quills. The second outfit is the Fort McPherson outfit uh, modeled by Ryan Vitrequa. And Ryan is the son of Alice and Ernest Vitrequa, and his grandparents are John and Bella Charlie, as well as Peter and Rebecca Vitrequa. Oh dear. Um, the, uh, the seamstresses from Fort McPherson are Rosie Firth, Ida Stewart, Shirley Stewart, Maureen Cooey, Martina Norman, Mary J. Blake, Elizabeth Collin, and Jane Charlie Sr. Chaz Saddington. Chaz is the son of Mary Coyne and his grandmother is Teresa Benoit. There's some traditional skills that we learn, a lot of traditional skills we brought back and uh, one of them is from the, the strings that are holding the mitts and the knife sheath. They are, we, we had to do it on a loom and it, uh, it was really interesting. The seamstresses for the Inuvik outfit were Lillian Wright, Ruth Wright, Billy Lenny, Trina Nursu, Gail Ann Raddy, and Donna Firth. This next outfit is the Sigachek outfit, and it's modeled by Ryan Moore. And Ryan is the son of Rosalind Moore, and his grandparents are Lucy and Cliff Moore from New York. Seamstresses from Sigichek were Agnes Mitchell, Maureen Clark, Rita Carpenter, Mary Andre Stewart, Alice Andre, Lisa Andre, Mavis Clark, Bella Norman, Irene Kendo, Joyce Andre, Virginia Benoit, Rose Clark, Donna Norman, Carol Norwegian, Terry Remy Sawyer, Leslie McCartney, and Misty Anderson. So the last outfit is the yellow knife outfit and it's modeled by Adolphus Lenny. <laughs> Adolphus' mother is Annie Kendi and his grandparents are Mary and Matthew Kendi from Fort McPherson. We had a difficult time also obtaining white hides. So um, these hides for the yellow knife outfit we got from Fort Ray. And all the rest of the hides that are used on the other outfits are from uh, the Yukon and Alberta. Um, 
put off like that. The trousers, you can see the feet are attached. And uh, I think that was for a quick getaway. <laughs> In case you have to get away quickly. <laughs> and <laughs> there's a beautiful knife sheath. The, all the fringes, uh, if you could just kind of uh, do this with your, your mitt, like the fringes are on top and there's fringes around the, the hood and everywhere and it's to help keep all the mosquitoes away, as well as decoration, so multi-purpose. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, There'll be an opportunity later, like to look close, look closely at the uh, outfits, and I hope you enjoyed it as well as we did. Thank you again.